we're going to read the Bible. So if you've got the Bible on your device or you've brought a paper Bible with you today, now's the chance to grab them. And we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 8. One Timothy chapter two and verses one to eight. The Apostle Paul writes these words. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I'm going to hand over to Raymond. Well, gentlemen, it's great to be here with you. I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we look at his word together. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, that helps us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your holy and mighty presence. Our prayer is that your word might be our rule, your spirit that he might be our teacher, and your honor and glory our supreme concern for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please have your Bibles open in front of you. There is an outline of where we're going, so you'll know that we are coming to an end eventually. In the wake of the murder of George Floyd in May 2020, the the Black Lives Matter movement, the reaction uh, to members of the royal family visiting uh, the Caribbean, The question of whether some lives matter more than others continues to be an issue. Uh, The Steven Spielberg epic wartime movie, Saving Private Ryan, raises the exact same question. Does some people's life matter more than others? Does one person's life matter more than others? than another's. I remember some years ago in a Bible study uh, where I explained the scandal of God's grace by saying that if Hitler had repented and believed in the Lord Jesus before he died, he has been in heaven with Jesus Christ ever since. Uh, Someone uh, replied, yes, but. The scandal of God's grace, however, means there can be no yes, but. To the God of the Bible, every life matters, even one as infamous as that of Adolf Hitler. Now, you may already know that 1 Timothy is not an early church manual telling us how the life of our local church should be ordered. Rather, Paul was writing through Timothy uh, to the first century Ephesian house churches because certain leaders were teaching a gospel that was different from the one true gospel given to Paul by the command of God and Christ Jesus. And instead, uh, they were regularly teaching about Jewish myths based on Old Testament family histories. The problem in the Ephesian house church is presenting itself as a sort of spiritual exclusivism or a Jewish elitism. 
Uh, Jews, you see, believed that uh, God hated non-Jews, like perhaps most of us in this room, Gentiles, and willed our destruction rather than our salvation, while, of course, loving the righteous, i.e. the good Jew. So rather than exercising their responsibilities in the church as good stewards of God through faith, these leaders were constantly introducing controversial and divisive speculations. And these had the effect of excluding certain people or groups of people in Ephesus. I mean, imagine if week after week the pastor of your local church was constantly focusing his preaching around the histories of superheroes like Iron Man or Captain America or Thor or better still, the Black Panther. After a while, some of you might begin to feel a bit left out as if the gospel was not inclusive of people who have little or no interest in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As if the Christian God of the Bible was only interested in certain kinds of people. Uh, for example, when I lived in South Africa many years ago, I remember one particular church that had a strong focus on reaching out to Jewish people, which is, which is great. But if that was not your passion, it became clear that perhaps that church was not the church for you. At my previous church, we started a, a Christians Against Poverty Debt Center. Yet in looking at this passage, I, I felt compelled to remind the congregation not to forget that seemingly sorted, wealthy, middle-class people need the gospel just as much as those crippled by their debt. Lest we fall into the same exclusivist trap of the churches in Ephesus in the first century. Now, I say all this because as you read uh, the passage that Stuart just read for us, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 to 8, you might be tempted to think it's all about prayer. Or specifically, the need to pray for our government as uh, we can all, so we can all live quiet and peaceful lives. I want to suggest to you that at best, these details are incidental to Paul's main purpose. Uh, the key thing in this section of God's Word is the idea of all people. Let me read the verses to you again. Verse 1, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanks even be made for all people. Verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. Verse 5, because there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. You see that? You see Paul's emphasis? All people, all people, all people. Well, if not, hopefully the three things I think God is saying to us uh, from his word here this morning may help us. The first is this. You and I need to have a gospel concern for all people. You and I need to have a gospel concern for all people. No matter where you come from, no matter what the color of your skin, no matter whether you're rich or poor, black or white, you and I need to have a gospel concern for all people. And I'm getting that from verses 1 and 2 in particular. Notice first that uh, there is a then or a therefore in the beginning of verse 1. And whenever you see a therefore, you know the rule, don't you? You've got to ask the question, what is it there for? Well, of course, it points us back to the I urge you of chapter 1 and verse 3. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1 begins with the same word, I urge then or I urge therefore. More immediately, the then or the therefore of chapter 2, verse 1, points back to the command of chapter 1, verse 18. The point is, all that Paul is urging here in chapter 2 is intimately connected with his command to Timothy to stop the false teachers in Ephesus with their exclusive speculative doctrines. Miss this clue and you will end up down all sorts of unhelpful rabbit holes as you try to study this chapter and indeed this whole book of 1 Timothy. Through Timothy, Paul is rebuking these wayward leaders. He is saying, instead of indulging in and being distracted by your empty and elitist speculative theology, as stewards of God's gospel, 
you should be praying for the gospeling of the world, for the evangelization of all people. And Bible commentators spill a lot of ink over the different words used for prayer in verse 1, but I think that misses the point. Paul is emphasizing that prayer needs to be made for all people. This should not only be the heartbeat of every truly Christian church, this job is so huge that you and I need to adopt all manner of praying in order to achieve it. But here is the stark reality, brothers. If you or I or our churches are not doing evangelism, if your career progression or getting your kids into that local grammar school is what dominates your horizon or agenda, rather than sharing your Christian faith, this will be completely lost on you, what Paul says here. One Bible commentator put it like this, the point is that all prayers of all types should be for all people. Now, another writer puts it this way, in every, possible, in every way possible, Paul urges, pray. Pray for those you know and those you do not, especially those in high places. Notice our passage begins and ends with prayer, verse 1, verse 8. Verse 8, I think, is a kind of transition verse that both looks back to verses 1 to 7 and forward to verses 9 to 15. You see, since men should be leading the church, Paul tells the men in the house churches of Ephesus in the first century, stop being angry and argumentative, and instead lift up, verse 8, holy hands as you pray for those around you that don't know God as Savior and Christ Jesus as their only hope. I think the reason Paul singles out praying for kings, rulers, or emperors in verse 2 is because the leaders of the churches in Ephesus, as they indulge in their theological flights of fancy, they're excluding or neglecting to pray for the pagan authorities that govern them. I used to think Paul was saying we should pray for our political leaders and the stability they bring so we can live lives uh, trouble-free lives in order to preach the gospel. Th there may be some truth in that, but I don't think that is Paul's main thrust in verse 2. Not least because elsewhere he writes, everyone, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12. And Paul's life was seldom peaceful and quiet. Do you notice that? If you read the book of Acts. He suffered a good deal for the sake of the gospel. I think Paul detected a growing and unhealthy sectarian spirit in the Ephesian house churches. One that was, a, was lacking in concern for certain kinds of people. Particularly where governing authorities were concerned. Leading to a potential upsetting of the social order. You see, in the pastoral epistles, 1 to Timothy and Titus... Living a peaceful or quiet life is all in all godliness and holiness, verse 2, is often very much connected with not bringing the gospel into disrepute, but rather making it attractive to outsiders, Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. As Christians, you and I must show ourselves to be godly and respectful in our prayers for society, its stability, and for its salvation. For example, God's people living in exile in Babylon were told by the prophet Jeremiah to pray for the prosperity of the city and to be practically committed to its welfare. My point is this. If the prime minister, Rishi Sunak, or Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, visited your church. They should, not leave, they should not only leave thinking what law-abiding citizens these Christians are, but also, regardless of whether we agree with their politics or policies, that our main concern was that they each come to personally know for themselves the trustworthy message of 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. 
that they are sinners in need of a saviour and not that we disagree with them for being too right-wing or too left-wing. Our political concerns must not be allowed to trump our gospel concerns because you and I need to have a gospel concern for all sorts of people, regardless of their culture, their credentials, their color, their class, or creed, whether political or religious. This is why our local churches should have mission partners based in other parts of the world that we are praying for regularly. But why must this be so, I hear you ask? Well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> you and I need to have gospel concerns for all people for at least two reasons. Which brings me to the second thing God is saying to us through his word here this morning. The first reason is this, because God, our Savior, has a gospel concern for all people. You and I need to have a gospel concern for all people because God, our Savior, has a gospel concern for all people. I'm getting that from verses 3 and 4. Look at it with me. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The reason you and I need to have a prayerful gospel concern for all people and not just a select few like family members or close friends or people who look and think just like us is because God our Savior has no favorites. So verse 3, it pleases him when you and I have a, a broad concern for all sorts of people. In the words of one writer, the gospel by its very nature is universal in scope, and any narrowing of that scope by a truncated theology or by novelties that appeal to the intellectual curiosities of the few is not the gospel of Christ. As far as the God of the Bible is concerned, a prayerful concern for all kinds of people, for all people, is a right, good, pleasing, God-honoring, and Christ-exalting thing. From the bottom of the social order to the top, the male leaders of the church should be leading the way in praying for the salvation of the world, of all people. Now, in verse 4, Paul is not saying that everyone will make it to heaven. I don't know if you know that. Not everyone is going to be in heaven, Lord willing, with each of us here this morning. Bible scholars tie themselves up in knots, debating, arguing over the dilemma posed by verse 4. How can God want everyone to be saved and yet not allow everyone to be saved? And to resolve this, some differentiate between what God wants to happen and what he will allow to happen. Others debate the seeming contradiction uh, between divine sovereignty and human moral responsibility. Now, as helpful as all that sort of thing is, I think the context of 1 Timothy is more helpful. When you see clearly the exclusivist, elitist, or ethically Bias Jewish false teaching by the leaders in Ephesus, alongside the trustworthy gospel message of a God who wants to save all kinds of sinners everywhere, i.e. all people. It seems clear to me that Paul writes what he does in verse 4 because he's anxious to emphasize the wide or all-inclusive, all-embracing nature of the gospel. God, our Savior, there's the big clue for you, is a saving God. So it is not that Paul believes in the universal acceptance of the gospel. No, rather, he believes very much, as should you and I, in the universal offer of the gospel. You and I can become narrower than the gospel demands while not being as broad or all-inclusive as the gospel allows. Always a danger we fall into that trap, brothers. So despite the busyness, the hustle and bustle of 
21st century life. You and I must make this our concern. So please notice that Paul connects God saving people with the knowledge of the truth, verse 4. If people are to be saved, they need to gain the knowledge of the truth. If the, gospel, if the church loses the gospel, it loses the power to bring all people to salvation. This is what makes verse, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 so incredibly sad and dangerous at the same time. The leaders of the churches in Ephesus were losing confidence in the message that alone could save people. And instead, we're indulging in empty, fruitless, speculative teaching that were threatening to harm and even empty their churches. What an incredibly tragic situation. But what might that mean for you and I in our churches? Well, it might be right and good to tackle from time to time, certain internal theological issues as and when they come up. So long as we don't lose sight of verses 3 and 4 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. So long as we don't forget that we worship a God who is concerned for the salvation of all people outside of our Christian communities. We must not allow ourselves to get distracted by internal theological arguments or squabbles that cause controversy and division while absorbing huge amounts of emotional energy. Such that we lose sight of the agenda of God, our Savior. So that we have little or no energy left over to reach all people outside our church communities. As you practically, as you look across your church year calendar... You should be concerned if it is filled with meetings taken up with merely Christians talking to other Christians about all the hot potatoes issues of our day. Same-sex marriage, gender, predestination, debates about how many angels can fit on a pinhead or whether Adam had a belly button or not. Frankly, when you understand the urgent and desperate need of the gospel, it is wise and prudent to avoid the distractions of such questions. Read a book, a good book on supralapsarianism, if you must. The well-known preacher, writer, and scholar, the late John Stott, told the story of visiting a church where the prayers consisted of a, a prayer for the pastor who was on holiday and for the healing of two women in the congregation. And this was all fine, but that was it. And this very narrow outlook meant he went away sad because it felt to him like that particular church worshipped a little local village god that cared nothing for the salvation of all people. Why is that so sad? Well, because God, our Savior, has a gospel concern for all sorts of people everywhere. Therefore, so should I, and so should you. But Paul gives us yet another reason why you and I need to have a gospel concern for all people everywhere, which brings me to the third and final thing I want you to see from God's word here this morning. First, you and I need to have a gospel concern for all people, because first, God our Savior has a gospel concern for all people. But third and last, because Christ Jesus himself demonstrated a gospel concern for all people. Because Christ Jesus himself demonstrated a gospel concern for all people, verses 5, 6, and 7. If the false teachers were essentially preaching a racist or ethnocentrically Jewish gospel that excluded Gentiles or non-Jews, then that would have been a very direct and personal attack on the work God had given the Apostle Paul to do during his lifetime. So in verse 7, Paul in effect says to these false teachers, 
with the elders, presbyters, wardens, whatever you call them. I am not lying, brothers, when I declare to you that God appointed me a herald and sent me. That's what the word apostle means, sent one. To be a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. I'm not lying. That's the job God gave me. But for our purposes, we need to focus on verse 5 and 6. The reason you and I need to have a prayerful gospel concern for all people is not just because God our Savior does, although that should be enough. But second, because Christ Jesus demonstrated the gospel concern for all people, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the proper time, 2,000 years ago, outside Jerusalem on a Roman cross. Notice the because at the beginning of verse 5. The central affirmation about God in the Old Testament concerns his unity or oneness. You see, if there were, were many gods, no single deity could claim or presume to have a monopoly on this world's worship or devotion. No one god, no one of these gods could, could could claim the world's adoration. At least not until he defeated all the other gods in some celestial battle. Becoming numero unero. But among God's people, and from a young age, children were taught to recite the Shema. That is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So love him with your everything. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. And this was a clear rebuke to the polytheism of the surrounding nations of the ancient world. This clear teaching of the Old Testament is picked up here by Paul in verse 5. It was a rebuke to the first century pantheon of Greek and Roman gods. It is also a rebuke to our modern pluralism, which states that there are many equally valid roads to a relationship with the one true and living God. No, there's not. For example, it is a corrective to Hinduism with its millions of gods or to ancestor worship, whether in Africa or in the Far East. All this attention... All this world's religious devotion rightly belongs to and therefore must be given to the one true Christian God of our Bibles. And because he alone is God, there is no other. And so he will not share this world's devotion, adoration, worship with any other. He cannot. His character won't allow it. So in Exodus 34 and verse 14, Moses wrote this, Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. So he wants all people everywhere to come to understand the truth about himself. He can't help himself. It has to be known. And one day will be known by every living creature that has ever lived on this planet. That is what the unity or the oneness of God means. And as a direct consequence, he has sent into our world one mediator and therefore only one way back to himself. Verse 5. Notice, not one God and many ways, but one God and one way through one mediator. Put that another way. This one and only way is an all-sufficient, a uniquely all-sufficient way 
Now, a mediator represents two sides and was tasked with bringing them together despite great personal cost. Think of a negotiator, perhaps, in an important business deal, like the recent deal between Twitter and Elon Musk, who acts as a kind of go-between, trying to bring the two sides to agree together. Well, Jesus Christ takes that to another level. As he takes on the toughest job of all, of adequately representing God and man. Notice Paul emphasizes the humanity of Jesus. Now, Paul is not saying Jesus was not also divine or fully God. That, again, is to miss the point. Now, Paul writes of the man, Christ Jesus, verse 5, because he wants the churches in Ephesus, and particularly the erring elders, the wardens, the presbyters, the leaders, to understand that Jesus is the man par excellence who alone is able to adequately represent all men or all people everywhere, regardless of their culture, their credentials, their color, their class, their creed. Only Jesus can represent all people because he's fully God and fully man in one person. And this was the very thing the church leaders in Ephesus were in danger, can you believe it, of forgetting how could you forget this? And for Jesus, our chief negotiator, the personal cost could hardly have been any higher. He gave himself, verse 6. He could literally give no more. As a ransom, instead of, on behalf of, all people, everywhere, including every single one of us in this room. The cross of Christ Jesus, although effective, especially for those who believe, chapter 4, verse 10, nevertheless stands over and against the needs of all people everywhere on this planet, all eight billion plus of them. Although God in and through Christ Jesus is potentially the savior of all people, his gospel is only effective for those who believe who pour their trust into the Lord Jesus. Just as we have a sufficient way through Christ Jesus, we also have a sufficient Savior in Christ Jesus. If you were more Pentecostal, someone would say, Amen, brother. Thank you. Jesus Christ demonstrated the gospel concern for all people. Can I say, if you're not a Christian here this morning, it's great that you're here. Thank you for listening to me for this far. I want to say to you that God is your Savior, and he's concerned about you. He wants to know you and love you and be in a relationship of eternal friendship with you. And Jesus Christ demonstrated a love for you, a concern for you by dying in your place on that cross 2,000 years ago. If you haven't come to him, come to him now. Turn from your wrong, all the wrong you've done, and turn to Jesus and ask him to help you to put your trust in what he did for you. So brothers, young and not so young, as those who should be at the forefront of leading or helping to lead your local churches. Where are you when it comes to your concerns, specifically your gospel concerns? Is that phrase even one that's on your radar? That I'm someone, I'm a man who should have gospel concerns, not just secular worldly concerns, but gospel concerns. Are your concerns aligned with those of God, your Savior, and Christ Jesus, who alone made your salvation possible, bringing hope in this world and the one to come? And if God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus' concerns are not your concerns, brothers, why not? And what are you going to do about it? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.
and maybe spent a minute thinking about that very question.